Good evening. My name's Michael. Um, I've just watched a video on EF Dower with Hamza at Hyde Park Speaker's Corner. And what he's basically saying, um, he's mentioning the fig tree incident in the Bible. And basically he's saying that Jesus can't be God because he cursed the fig tree, even though it wasn't the season for figs. So he's saying he can't be God. And why did he curse a fig tree when it wasn't the season for figs? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to refute Hamza and give him some information. Because what, what he actually does, Hamza, he doesn't do any exegesis of passages. He doesn't look at what scholars have to say about this passage. He just adds his own interpretation, his own insight, and he thinks he's refuted us. Well, he hasn't. So I'm going to refute you today, my friend. So I'll just say, Jesus in the Synoptic Gospels went to a fig tree looking for food to eat. Matthew 21, 18 to 22. And it's also in Mark 11, 12 to 14 and 20 to 21. When he saw that there were no figs on the tree, he cursed it. The problem with this story is that it wasn't the season for figs according to Mark 11, verse 13. If Jesus is God, why didn't he know that it wasn't the season for figs? And why would he curse the tree when it wasn't his fault that it wasn't fig season? So I'm going to give you an answer to that. Firstly, it's a very reasonable explanation why Jesus cursed the fig tree, even though it wasn't the season for figs. Even before the season, fig trees produce little knobs which are eaten by a passerby. As the late renowned NT scholar F.F. F. Bruff noted, the other miracle is the cursing of the barren fig tree. A stumbling block to many. They feel it is unlike Jesus and so someone must have misunderstood what actually happened or turned a spoken parable into an acted miracle or something like that. Some, on the other hand, welcome the story because it shows that Jesus was human enough to get unreasonably annoyed on occasion. It appears, however, that a close acquaintance with fig trees would have prevented such misunderstandings. The time of the fig is not yet, says Mark, for it was just before Passover, about six weeks before the fully formed fig appears. The fact that Mark adds these words shows that he knew what he was talking about. When the fig trees, sorry, when the fig leaves appear about the end of March, they are accompanied by a crop of small knobs called takish by the Arabs. It's a sort of forerunner of the real figs. These takish are eaten by peasants and others when hungry. They drop off before the real fig is formed. But if the leaves appear unoccupied by Tashk, there will be no figs that year. So it was evident to our Lord when he turned aside to see it, if any of these Tashk on the fish tree to assuage his hunger for the time being, that the absence of the Tash meant that there would be no figs when the time of figs came. For all its fair foliage, it was a fruitless and a hopeless tree. Another evangelical scholar, Craig S. Keener, makes the following observation. At Passover season in late March or early April, fig trees are often in leaf on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. At this time of year, such fig trees contained only green early figs called tashk, which ripen around June but often drop off before that time, leaving only green leaves on the tree. A leafy tree lacking such early figs, however, would bear no figs at all that year. I recommend this commentary. It says, a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, A. Kina. Thus, what was thought to be an example against the veracity of the New Testament ends up actually becoming a rather persuasive argument for its historical reliability. This amplifies the minute accuracy of the synoptic gospels, both in time and place, i.e. this took place during the month of Passover, 
Figs located on the eastern side of the Mount of Olives, etc. It also provides evidence for why did Je Jesus curse the fig tree for not bearing fruit, although it was not even fig season. An early dating of Matthew and Mark, or at the very least, shows that they were dependent on very old and early material, well before the fall of Jerusalem. After all, the knowledge of these details would most likely have been lost or unknown to authors writing after the destruction of Jerusalem. Moreover, the cursing of the fig tree is, dis is played or acted out parable, one which warned the nation of Israel of impending judgment. In the words of Messianic scholar David Stern, if Yeshua's cursing and drying up the fig tree had been a petulant reaction to disappointment because he couldn't satisfy his hunger, it would be unworthy of anyone, let alone the Messiah. But Yeshua is making a point by means of prophetic drama acted out in a, in a parable. The Tanat examples include Yirmiyahu, who brought and broke a clay bottle, Jeremiah 19. And Yezekiel, who made and then burned up a model of Jerusalem, Ezekiel 4, verse 5. For a later New Testament incident, instance, the Acts 21, verses 10 to 11. Even out of season, a fig tree in leaf, it must have been in leaf to be seen in the distance. And this holds forth the promise of fruit. The normal early season for figs in Israel is June, but the early unripe fruit begins to show itself even before the spring leaves appear on the branches, often before Passover. We know that Yeshua, which is Jesus in Hebrew, by the way, expects God's people to put forth the fruit of righteousness and that unproductive branches are thrown in the fire. Matthew 7, 16 to 20, Matthew 12, 33, Matthew 13, 49, Matthew 18 to 23. Thus, the drying up of the fig tree is an acted out warning in keeping with Proverbs 27, 18. He who tends a fig tree will eat its fruit and he who serves his master will be honoured. Yeshua here is teaching his followers what it means to serve their master, God. It means simply to have the kind of trust that comes from God and that they will wither away if they don't. Yeshua neither acts from peak nor perform arbitrary miracles like a magician. Every one of his supernatural acts has spiritual significance. In fact, the Old Testament uses the fig tree as a symbol of the nation of Israel. I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine. There will be no figs on the tree and their leaves will wither. What I have given them will be taken from them. Jeremiah 8 verse 13. You may say the Lord has raised up prophets for us in Babylon, but this is what the Lord says about the king who sits on David's throne and all the people who remain in this city, your countrymen, who did not go with you into exile. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will send the sword, the famine and plague against them, and I will make them like poor figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten. I will pursue them with a sword, famine and plague, and they will make them abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth and an object of cursing and horror, of scorn and reproach among all the nations where I drive them. For they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord, words that I sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets. And you exiles have not listened either, declares the Lord. Jeremiah 29, 15 to 19. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your fathers, it was like seeing it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. But when but when they came to Baal Peur, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. Ephraim is blighted, their root is withered, they yield no fruit. Even if they bear ch children, I will slay the cherried offspring. Hosea 9, 10 to 16. What misery is mine? I am like one who gathers fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, 
none of the early figs that I crave. The godly have been swept from the land. Not one upright man remains. All men lie in wait to shed blood. Each hunts his brother with a net. Both hands are skilled in doing evil. The ruler demands gifts. The judge accepts bribes. The powerful dictate what they desire. They all conspire together. The best of them is like a bria. The most upright, worse than a thorn hedge. The day of your watchman has come. The day God visits you. Now is the time of their confusion. Micah 7 verses 1 to 4. All your fortresses are like fig trees with their first ripe fruit. When they are shaken, the figs fall into the mouth of the eater. Nahum 3 verse 12. So this, this, these passages help clarify why Jesus did what he did. Christ came searching for what the Old Testament says Yahweh searches after, namely an indication that Israel was a fruitful tree and not barren and dry. Yet, instead of finding the early fig, which would have demonstrated that Israel was spiritually alive and capable of bearing the fruit which satisfies God, Christ found the nation spiritually dead and barren. In light of it, Israel's spiritual barrenness, God would cut down his fig tree, his very own vine, and burn it. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig around it and fertilise it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. Luke 13 verses 6 to 9. He then began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, he put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the wine press and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him and sent him away empty handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son whom he loved. He sent him last of all, saying, they will respect my son. But the tenant said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Mark 12 verses 1 to 9. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you are not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Matthew 23, 37 to 39. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you even, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognise the time of God's coming to you. Luke 19, 41 to 44. So this was the meaning behind Jesus cursing the fig tree as a sign that God came looking for spiritual fruitfulness among his covenant people, but saw none and would therefore bring destruction upon them. As it stands, there is no problem with Jesus cursing the fig tree, nor does this act undermine his absolute perfect deity. So what I suggest you do, Hamza, also as well, if you think that I'm not answered this correctly, I suggest that you go on to Bible Hub and you look on the commentaries section on this particular passages on the cursing of the fig tree. And you will find, my friend, that every scholar, every person that talks about this event would not have the opinion that you have. You are the only one 
in the world of scholarly research and investigation has come up this opinion that Jesus isn't God because he cursed the fig tree. My friend, you are sadly mistaken. You haven't studied, you haven't done any exegesis and you haven't looked at the commentary and you've not looked at the context of the passage. You just put your own opinion there and I've refuted you today on that opinion. If you can come back and refute me properly, which I don't think you will, I'm afraid I have refuted your argument, my friend. So please don't add your own opinion to what scholars have already looked at. These are people that have been studying this for years. They look at the history, they look at the time, they look at the time, they look at the area and the context of the passage. That's something that you don't do, Hans, and I urge you, sir, to start adding your own opinion. Thank you. God bless.